Hello and welcome to the July meeting of the Mornington Peninsula Astronomical Society. Due to the current COVID-19 pandemic restrictions in place, we've uh, reverted back to the pre-recorded um, version. So no meeting uh, in person at the Bryce, at least for the next uh, couple of months, I would say. Um, you'll notice on the uh, initial screen that uh, one of the great hopes at the moment is that uh, Comet Neowise, which was discovered by a uh, NASA satellite some time ago, earlier in the year, um, is making a uh, wonderful naked eye show in the Northern Hemisphere and whether or not it actually survives uh, long enough to be visible in the Southern Hemisphere remains to be seen. Um, currently uh, they're getting a good show because, number one, it's uh, very close to the sun at the moment, so the comet uh, heats up and uh, outgasses, and so should give quite a, uh, a bright tail. Um, and also, uh, it's also relatively close uh, to the Earth. Now, by the time it swings around the sun, and Earth has moved a little bit around its orbit, uh, it may not be as favourable at all uh, for us to see. So just because we're getting a very bright uh, show at the moment doesn't necessarily mean uh, ne when later on uh, this month uh, it appears in our skies it'll be anything more than just a faint uh, fuzzball. But uh, fingers crossed, you never know with comets, they can break apart uh, unexpectedly and uh, release uh, new gases. Um, but uh, fingers crossed, uh, as these things don't usually occur uh, other than maybe uh, a couple of times uh, in a lifetime. Now you'll notice on the initial slide that was uh, taken uh, from uh, China by the photographer uh, Xin Zhuan Lin that um, it was showing two very clear tails, the uh, blue coloured uh, iron tail and uh, an orangey yellowy white um, dust tail. The iron tail is composed as it says of uh, ions which are charged particles the size of atoms so really really small and uh, charged and uh, as a consequence the solar wind that comes from our sun and blows out in all directions in space away from the sun uh, quite readily blows those charged uh, very small particles uh, in the exact opposite direction uh, of the sun so if you were to uh, ask the question whereabouts is uh, the sun relative to that picture of the comet it'll be uh, in the exact uh, opposite direction from uh, that uh, blue tail now the other tail is the dust tail, and dust is uh, obviously grains of material that uh, are quite a lot larger than uh, atoms. Uh, certainly uh, the size of uh, smoke particles, if not um, much larger than that. And consequently they do tend to get uh, affected more by uh, gravity and the motion of the comet. And consequently uh, they lag behind as uh, the, the comet moves on, and the pressure from the uh, solar wind from the sun is uh, not uh, sufficient to actually cause them to blow in the exact opposite direction. So they uh, lag behind and that's why um, you see the, uh, the wonderful dust tail uh, move off uh, in an arc as um, the comet itself is actually arcing around uh, the sun. Now uh, welcome of course uh, to anyone who uh, is uh, attending one of our meetings uh, for the first time and welcome to uh, to the society. You've joined at a very strange time. We usually have a lot of face-to-face uh, -face activities, um, but at the moment uh, everything is uh, confined to uh, being online. Now, um, given that it's uh, July, we have our annual general meeting to uh, begin with, and we'll get to that uh, in a moment. Uh, that will go for uh, approximately uh, 20 or 30 minutes, and um, uh, this is a meeting that has to occur uh, by law once uh, every year for uh, all incorporated uh, societies. And this year, instead of being done face to face uh, as part of this meeting at the Briars, uh, it is being done uh, by uh, Zoom separately. So that uh, has already been uh, recorded uh, this evening. Uh, following the AGM, I'll uh, give a rundown of some of the events that have occurred in the past month and uh, coming up in the following month before the next meeting. Then we'll have the talk by Dr. Rosemary Mardling from Monash University, who sadly can't be with us in person, but we will certainly invite her back uh, next year when, uh, fingers crossed, uh, restrictions are lifted sufficiently such that uh, in-person uh, meetings can occur. And she was going to talk uh, about uh, insights on exoplanets, which um, gave uh, rise to um, uh, 
uh, the uh, some of the winners of the 2019 Nobel Prize uh, in Physics. Following that, um, we'll go to uh, Sky for the Month by uh, Mark uh, Stevens, who's uh, sent in his uh, wonderful contribution as usual. And also um, Sky Murphy as well has uh, sent in one uh, all about uh, colours, and uh, that indeed may be quite uh, relevant, especially with uh, uh, that uh, wonderful picture of a comet seen before. Uh, after uh, Sky's uh, segment, uh, I'll then show just one video uh, this month on that sort of carries on from the theme of uh, last month's uh, meeting on uh, vision. And these are further tips on how to uh, improve your uh, night vision. And in this particular case, it's a, um, a short video that comes from the Northern Hemisphere. Mm -hmm. So don't be surprised that the stars are moving in the opposite direction across the sky to what uh, we would normally see in the Southern Hemisphere. Then at the end, uh, to uh, close the meeting, we have uh, another great contribution from uh, Paula Miles and her husband, uh, Mark Miles. And uh, this case, uh, it's a, a very modern version of a, a classical uh, tune. So uh, do stay tuned for that one. Or uh, if you're particularly interested in the music up front, just jump uh, to the end of this um, uh, video recording and uh, see it right away. So with that, we will now move uh, straight into uh, the annual general meeting. There we go. We now have a quorum. <laughs> and right on eight o'clock as well. There you go. And uh, others uh, will undoubtedly uh, join us. And uh, if I notice them sitting there wanting to come in and uh, you see my eyes flick around the screen a bit, you'll know what it's all about. All right. Well, I'll make, uh, I'll make a start as it is. So welcome to the uh, annual general meeting of the Mornington Peninsula Astronomical Society for uh, 2020. And uh, given the COVID situation, uh, we're doing this all uh, virtually for uh, for the first time, at least uh, for an AGM. Uh, so if I uh, flick across to the slides, bear with me while I try to share my screen. And if you tell me when you can see the screen successfully. Yes. Yep, it's there. Yep. yep. Good day. Okay, let me, uh... Oh, Peter Lowe's coming in. Right, okay, well, let, uh, let's begin. Uh, number one, do we have any apologies, uh, Nerida? Let me unmute myself and start again. Uh -huh. no, yeah. no apologies that I've heard of. I've messaged Simon, but he hasn't responded yet, so... Okay. No, I'm aware of at this stage. Right, okay. Well, we've got 13 in the meeting at the moment. Uh, some, are, some are on video, some are uh, just uh, audio. Um, you, when, when you came in, you would have automatically gone on to mute. So um, if you want to uh, say anything along the way, you'll have to uh, unmute it at, uh, at your end of things. Uh, so that's apologies. Number two, the minutes of the previous AGM, uh, that was sent around with the details for logging on. Uh, to uh, this uh, Zoom meeting. So uh, as I was uh, the secretary uh, this time last year, I'll uh, move that the minutes uh, be uh, accepted. Can I have a seconder, please? I think that's uh, Dave Everyone's waving his arms. There's that, that... Mark's waving. Uh, oh, okay, I, I, I didn't see, I didn't yeah, see Mark. Yeah. Who, who waved first? Okay, Ass assume that was Dave that I uh, I saw. Hi. Yep. And um, all right. Can we uh, have a, a show of hands uh, if um, if we uh, we accept the minutes as is? Just put your hand up. At least those that were at the meeting, those that weren't at the meeting, you wouldn't <laughs> know. Okay. Looks uh, fairly uh, unanimous. Move on to um, the uh, president's report when I uh, get the slides working. Right. To begin with, with the uh, President's report, I'd like to uh, thank uh, the uh, outgoing committee, some of which are uh, on this uh, call. First of all, there's um, Mark uh, Stevens, the uh, Vice President. I'm not sure if he's on the call. I can't see him on my screen, but uh, maybe he's there uh, somewhere. Uh, 
Uh, he, of course, does uh, Sky for the month and has been uh, nicely grappling with uh, how to do it uh, offline in, uh, in PowerPoint and uh, just about mastered that. And of course, throughout the year, he's helped at uh, various barbecues and looking after the site and, uh, and certainly the many events that we've done over the last uh, 12 months. Jamie Hughes uh, on the call as well is uh, Mr. Treasurer and also uh, general uh, person at uh, everything to do with barbecues and uh, around the sites and uh, looking after events as well. And there've been lots of events. Uh, Nerida's on here as well, dutifully taking uh, the minutes as uh, secretary. Yeah, waving. Uh, she's also um, the media officer. So she's the one responsible for putting things uh, out to uh, the press while we've still got uh, a press out there to send to. Uh, she also uh, is one of the ones looking after uh, Facebook and uh, Instagram. I've just got to let a couple of extra people into the waiting room. Okay, so we've now got 15 on the meeting. Yep, okay. Yeah, it's caused me to uh, change slides for some reason. There we go, back to that. Um, and uh, looking after new members uh, as well. Uh, Anders, who's also, I noticed uh, on there as well, as I was looking through, he looks after the, uh, the observatory and uh, obviously site maintenance and uh, events such as the APW and things like that. Uh, Simon, I'm not sure if Simon's on the, uh, the call or not, um, but uh, he's the one responsible for everything to do with uh, merchandise and uh, making sure the, uh, the public nights in particular are done safely. Dave Rolf, who's uh, on there as well with an artistic background uh, behind him. Uh, he also does uh, lots of things around the sites as well and occasionally uh, hops in there as a contractor to put um, various bits of electronics uh, up on site as well. Uh, Trevor, I'm not sure if Trevor was on uh, the call or not, but uh, he um, certainly was doing uh, most of the public night talks while we um, had public nights. And uh, lastly, Peter Lowe, who uh, I saw uh, came into the call uh, just before. I can't see him on my screen though. Um, was also oh, I'm still here. Oh, you're still there. Good. Um, was I, public, I, noticed, I'm all the pictures I noticed that nobody's wearing masks. <laughs> Don't tempt me. Don't tempt me. <laughs> okay, we've now got 18 coming into the call. Okay, let me uh, move on. Notable features uh, since um, this time last year, uh, about the time of the AGM, we had the uh, Music of the Heavens concert, which uh, appear in Jamie's report, which is the first time we've done a collaboration with a, uh, a non-science uh, entity. And that was with the uh, Southern Peninsula Concert Band. And that was something very, very different and uh, went well. We hosted another Vastrock, uh, which is certainly the third one that uh, I'm aware of that uh, MPAS has hosted. And also this time we combined it with the uh, APW uh, for this, uh, that, that year, for last year. Um, there was also a visit by a few members to um, uh, the, uh, the radio fest down at uh, Rosebud with a solar telescope and which I think was dutifully 100% clouded out from memory so it left a uh, lasting impression with them. Been a number of site improvements done at the Briars. Uh, obviously the shipping container has appeared and that's been uh, very valuable at times. Uh, I believe there's a new mount as well uh, in the observatory and uh, lots of other smaller things uh, having occurred as well. A uh, defibrillator has uh, appeared next door to us, so uh, within uh, fairly easy reach of us. Uh, our meetings are now all available on YouTube, assuming that the technology is kind, and indeed even this meeting hopefully will uh, appear up there uh, with the uh, rest of the July meeting. And we've had uh, music start to uh, appear as well in some of the meetings, uh, tapping on expertise from uh, other uh, members. Range of merchandise has expanded greatly as uh, Simon has, uh, has been, been running around buying all sorts of um, things in all sorts of areas. And um, other notable things, uh, certainly earlier in the year, there was a lot of interference um, by smoke from the bushfires and indeed that helped keep numbers down at uh, public nights as well. People are concerned, I guess, about asthma and so forth. Library is coming together well with uh, Lara doing uh, a lot of the cataloguing and uh, tidying things up and getting rid of duplicates. We had our very first uh, work experience student at the observatory from uh, uh, year 10 earlier, just got in just before the COVID uh, first lockdown came, came through with the first wave. Um, the, we've got uh, security cameras and uh, online weather station now at the uh, Briars and transmitting uh, round the clock. 
Uh, obviously, the COVID pandemic restrictions came in and uh, promptly took away our access to the Briars. And this, of course, is occurring at the moment. And that makes uh, planning uh, an interesting challenge for all concerned. Um, needs to say, but during the restrictions, all our public uh, school and scout and guide nights were uh, called off, whether or not they were at the Briars or um, done remotely. And they're called off to uh, end of uh, the year. So consequently, at the moment, our main income source uh, during the lockdown time is really from uh, membership fees. So uh, a very, very different situation to what we've had in the past. So annual statistics, quick uh, look here. Um, if you look, uh, the uh, number of public nights is very, very small, down at 11. Uh, get down to only four scout and guide type nights. Overall attendance is around the 2000 mark, which is down very, very significantly, obviously due to uh, COVID. Uh, we would probably be up around the 4000 uh, by now otherwise. And uh, it's been uh, pretty cloudy uh, conditions as well. If you look at the uh, public nights, two, th two thirds coverage uh, by cloud. Now you'll notice that uh, of our um, 282 current financial members, we've uh, got a pretty good mix in there of um, uh, ladies. Uh, so uh, we have 43% uh, females. So in other words, this ain't uh, just a, a boys sport and hobby to do. Uh, we still have quite a lot of members that are yet to renew for uh, this year. And some of those may be uh, due to um, COVID. And uh, if for some reason that they all renewed, we'd be uh, well over the 400 member mark at, uh, at that case. Mr. Treasurer, over to you if you wish to take yourself off mute. There we go. Can everybody hear me? Yep. Excellent. All right. Okay. Um, we'll just go through this hopefully fairly quickly. Um, oh, we've lost all the formatting, but that won't matter. Um, just a few features of the year. Um, income from subscriptions are down on previous year. Um, um, partly, I think, mostly affected by COVID-19 in the back half of the year and not picking up new memberships in the back half. Um, there were some extra events uh, on the on the profile, uh, Vastrock and Music of the Heavens. Um, combining Vastrock and the Astrophotography Workshop, I think, turned out uh, quite successful from the financial point of view. We made a small profit from the event, uh, which I think is a minor miracle given uh, how Vastrock seemed to run in, in the past. Uh, Music of the Heavens was uh, a very small amount of profit as well, which is good, um, and some retained assets from that as well, which is... Uh, means we can hopefully run similar events in the future. <clears throat> um, there's been some investment in different Briars facilities up there, <clears throat> including the shipping container. Um, we've put in some extra security measures with the safety cameras, um, weather station, and um, we also put in a new mount in the observatory um, where one of, the, uh, one of the mounts wasn't quite up to the task. And given they are really our money earners when we can, when we can open, um, we saw that as a wise investment, both for members and for public. Uh, next slide, please, Pete. Income from subscriptions were um, yeah down a bit this year, and again, I think it's just the COVID in the back half that's really hurt us there. Um, no noticeable real slips. Um, there's been a few family five years in in the past that have probably affected this year a little bit, but um, other than that. Um, they're just down a little bit, and I think that's probably community distraction as well as the COVID situation. Next slide, please. Uh, income from events was actually still quite healthy considering um, it would have been, a, if we'd finished without uh, the COVID situation happening, it would have been a very, very strong finish to the year, I think. Um, so the public night income had been strong. Um, other viewing nights and things were okay. Um, the Astrophotography Day there had changed with the Vastrock. Um, uh, might, of note there is the Vastrock takings is over two financial periods, not just one. Um, some of it was in the back half of last year and Music of the Heavens as well in there. Uh, Scout and Guide Nights have picked up quite considerably as well. Well done there, Peter, with that format. Um, seems to be graining a, a bit of momentum and, and a bit of a reputation amongst the groups too, which is great. Next slide, please. Um, other income and cost of sales. So we've got some clothing sales, some merchandise sales, some bits and pieces. Uh, didn't manage to pick up any grants this year, so we're hoping we might find a few more grants about next year, but uh, that's something. 
uh, interest income, well, we know what interest rates are like, so we're not going to make a lot of money off that. In terms of purchases for resale, so we have stocked up a bit on purchases for merchandise. Um, Simon's got a good stock of stuff up there, so uh, once once we get back to opening, um, see Simon for some merchandise. Next slide, please. Um, some of the big expenses of the year, so we had the uh, the shipping container. Um, Tribe booking fees are kind of part of our business and the way we run it these days. Um, to to fathom running the whole lot without tribe booking would be a, a whole lot different than what it is now. Um, advertising fees, we've been pushing and driving PBN sales through advertising through Facebook, which is reasonably cost effective for what we do, but we'll see that in the, few, in the further slides. Um, security camera upgrade, weather station upgrade, mount upgrade, I think we've covered them slightly. Uh, next slide, please, Peter. Now, I don't know if anyone can see the detail there or has any questions about the detail. Um, most of the bits and pieces in there, um, all weather facility will include things like the security cameras and um, bits and pieces, observatory repairs, I think uh, repairs and maintenance is a mount included in there. Working bee and event provisions, we had a society dinner as well as our normal barbecues and other bits and pieces. Um, the vest truck, um, again, all the food, catering and accommodation for that. Uh, music of the heavens, um, there are all of the uh, expenses that went into costumes as well as uh, the matting and, and a few other things that went on there. Uh, badges, which are now part of the new membership system. Um, liability insurance. Uh, lawn mowing, dry booking, postage, PO box rental, um, electricity, which is creeping up there, which um, uh, we've been invited to partake in some type of uh, group deal with the council. So hopefully uh, something comes of that and we can see some savings in there as well. But that's the expenses for the year at approximately 21.3k. Next slide, please. <coughs> um, Looking at uh, the expenses comparison to last year, the expenses are actually 11,000 down on last year. The large difference there is the um, kitchen renovation that was was completed in, in the last uh, financial. So, next slide, please. Breaking it all down to a summary, if we add and subtract all the bits and pieces, we come down to a net profit number for the year of $5,685.67, which is up on last year, um, but um, a bit COVID affected as well. So the number looks reasonably good, but we're also heading into what is going to be a probably a historically quiet period for us. Um, as you can see, a large portion of our income comes from events that we can't hold at the moment. So um, it's going to be an interesting time moving forward as to what we can do, where we can uh, spend our money and when we can get back to doing what we do best. Um, and I think that's all we've got for this, I think. Is that, is that the last slide, Peter? I'm on. Oh, yep, the cash at bank, sorry. Uh, they're the cash at bank numbers. So you'll see our uh, cash assets at the end of 2020 equaled $45,625.36. This includes our cash box, cash reserve, and check account. Uh, did anyone have any questions? If not, in that case, we need to pass a resolution that the financial report be accepted as a fair and true representation of the financial status. Um, Jamie is the treasurer. I assume that you're moving that be so? I would like to move that, Peter, yes. Yep. Um, I shall uh, second it. And uh, if we could have a uh, show of hands from around the room, please, uh, for acceptance. Okay. Yep. There's a good show of hands. Yep. Fantastic. Election of the next committee. Over to uh, our illustrious Madam Secretary. Okay, hello, everyone can hear me? Yep. Yep, okay. So I hereby declare the MPAS Management Committee is now dissolved and the incoming committee roles that are available are President, Vice President, Secretary, Treasurer, and there are five ordinary committee positions. So the people who have nominated for each role, we've got Peter Skilton for President, Mark Stevens, Vice President, 
myself, Nerida for Secretary, Jamie Pohl for Treasurer, and the five ordinary committee members are Anders Hamilton, Simon Ham, Peter Lowe, Trevor Hand, and Guido Tack. So there are no positions that have extra people, so we don't need to vote for anything. So I hereby declare the nominations as elected. And I think that's all. Right. Hey. You're done. Yay. Thank you very much. Well done, everybody. Welcome, Guido. Special business. Well, there was no special business. And uh, last slide is uh, one of uh, other thanks. So obviously I uh, wish to thank uh, Greg Walton, who's been keeping a low profile during COVID days. He, of course, uh, has uh, been busy in the background, of course, with putting out the uh, eScorpius newsletter, which takes a, a lot of effort to uh, put together each, uh, each time round. And he tends to uh, travel a lot around uh, the countryside and is our uh, traveling correspondent uh, at all sorts of places around um, Australia. And obviously when he's uh, here, he, uh, he's uh, doing the uh, site improvements as well. We also have Ian Sullivan and also helped by Jim Blanksby who uh, look after the guest speakers, uh, organizing them and uh, if necessary, shuttling them to and from the, uh, the meeting to uh, speak. Uh, Lara Conway does uh, the uh, library organization. I don't think she's uh, on the call. Uh, Fred Crump is our uh, crowd controller and musterer and uh, he's put together a couple of Apollo posters now and uh, you uh, you will get to see his rocket in the, the June video when I uh, upload that from uh, the meeting. Also like to thank uh, from the Grierson family Piper Ashley and Jamie and also from the Rolf family Jamie and Landon for being gatekeepers at the public night and uh, keeping keeping all the undesirables away and collecting the money from all the desirables and leaving them in. Um, also like to thank uh, particularly for uh, organising of the social events and uh, all the sorts of things that are needed like washing up the dishes and everything by uh, Pia Pedersen, Anne and uh, Jeff Dan as well. Uh, I'm not sure either of them, any of those are online tonight. Uh, I'd like to thank John Cleverton for his many and uh, diverse contributions to eScorpius and I know John is on the, on the line so uh, welcome John. Uh, Sky Murphy as well, who uh, looks after proofreading of the newsletter before Greg uh, Walton sends uh, them out uh, each uh, couple of months. And she's also been uh, contributing meeting segments uh, like um, Mark Stevens has been doing and also looking after the, uh, the music uh, group. Uh, I'd also like to thank uh, Paula and Marina for uh, sending in uh, music that we've been using in the meeting and uh, we, we've got some heavy metal ones coming up uh, soon as well from them. Um, many, many viewing night volunteers in the days when we used to have viewing nights for public school scouts and guides and uh, hopefully it won't be uh, too many months or years until we uh, get to uh, go through those again. And last and uh, dare I say, most certainly not least, um, is uh, Peter Lowe, who I see uh, is uh, on there proudly wearing a bright yellow beanie. Um, uh, it helps to have a lump of metal in your head. You need to keep it warm. Oh, right. Okay. So you, you've hidden the tinfoil tin hat underneath it, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And uh, committee, the outgoing committee um, has uh, decided to confer life uh, membership on Peter, effective uh, as of uh, today. Obviously, with the COVID situation, um, we're not going to be able to uh, present it in person and taking him uh, through the uh, the initiation process for uh, life members, um, handing over strange looking spinning orbs and things of that nature. But um, as of uh, as of now, he's uh, officially a, a life member um, in absentia. Um, it may Ooh. very well be this time next year before we uh, have to do it, but uh, I, I, I thank him. He's also, I believe, one of the founding members of uh, the society. Is that, that right, Peter? Yeah, yeah. I've been doing uh, amateur astronomy for 60 something years, much more than the society. I was doing it long before the society was formed. And uh, I believe you're writing up the history of the society as well. Well, now, now that I've got my head back, uh, <laughs> I'm starting on it. Fantastic. And that's it. That's it. And uh, close of the meeting as of uh, eight uh, twenty-two. So we've managed to get that done in just about uh, twenty minutes. So I don't think it's the fastest we've ever done. 
Um, but uh, thank you everybody here. The, um, uh, the normal uh, proceedings of the meeting won't be live uh, online this month. Uh, we're putting it together pre-recorded so something should appear around about the, the weekend for the uh, July meeting instead. And uh, the speaker that we had originally uh, arranged to come down and talk has instead uh, provided us uh, a video of her talk to use, uh, which we'll do instead and we'll invite her back down um, sometime next year as well to hopefully do it in person, uh, assuming that all the virus restrictions are uh, over and done with. All right, well, if uh, nobody else has uh, anything, thank you very much for attending the AGM. And uh, that went surprisingly smoothly. And uh, maybe we'll do it this way uh, <laughs> in future. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Well done. Thank Might you, everybody. <laughs> OK. Congratulations, Cheers, everyone. Congratulations, Pete. Thank you very much. Yep. Yeah, good Cheers, to see you, everybody. Babe. Bye. Absolutely. Bye, everyone. Well, welcome back. Now we'll take a quick look at uh, recent events, given that we haven't had any uh, public scout or uh, girl guide viewing nights or uh, other school events whatsoever due to uh, the uh, lockdown conditions. It uh, should be a fairly short uh, list. Um, what, uh, what you'll notice is that um, the uh, uh, light pollution uh, Guinness World Record attempt uh, occurred uh, around Australia and indeed uh, I believe they did uh, achieve uh, the world record. Um, it was uh, I think several thousand people had to enter um, their estimate of uh, the light pollution level at their location and in this particular case for the southern hemisphere it was using what uh, the southern cross looks like in the sky and how many stars uh, could actually uh, be seen and uh, after some uh, deliberation I believe that was uh, achieved. I can't remember now what the exact number was but uh, it was certainly more than necessary to um, uh, get that uh, that world record. A um, couple of days after that we had a, a, committee, me a committee meeting which uh, was also done online again uh, and the main things uh, that were covered uh, at this meeting was the um, decision to uh, confer a uh, new life member for uh, the society and um, also um, looking at uh, quotes for uh, toilets uh, given that uh, you'd be aware that up at Briar's uh, site we only have one uh, unisex toilet and uh, the Echo House was also looking for um, toilet expansion as well so it is quite possible that we may have um, a, a common application there with the Shire to um, get uh, get combined toilets uh, instead so that um, was uh, discussed at some length given that the Echo House had actually uh, um, provided some initial quotes uh, for that. The other thing about the toilets in the meantime while we still have our one is that um, instead of uh, the key being in the observatory we're going to install, when we can get access to the site again, going to install a, uh, a key safe and store the key for the toilet actually uh, next to the door so that uh, you don't need access to the observatory to uh, get into uh, the toilets on the site, which should make it a lot, um, a lot simpler for, uh, for people caught short. Um, on the 8th of July, about uh, a week ago, um, the uh, restrictions uh, for uh, COVID-19 uh, increased to stage three and consequently uh, access to the Briar site is uh, removed once again for all members uh, and at this stage it's until uh, around about uh, early September assuming uh, everything all goes well with that uh, lockdown. In the meantime, we hope uh, Comet Nearwise uh, will put on a good show. It's due to just start to come above the horizon uh, for us in Victoria around about the 24th of uh, July. If uh, you look around 6 p.m. now, 6 p.m. is still going to be a quite strong twilight. Uh, and if this is, is likely to be quite uh, faint. Um, so uh, you might need a pair of binoculars to see it unless uh, we're uh, pleasantly surprised and whether or not you'll see a tail um, will depend on the days afterwards as it starts to rise higher in the sky um, from night to night uh, as it swings uh, around the sun. At the moment we can't see it in the sky because um, it appears in the daytime sky for us very close uh, to the sun so uh, no hope of seeing it. But uh, fingers crossed uh, hopefully we will see something uh, late July 
uh, towards um, middle of uh, August. However, uh, just because it's a naked eye and uh, quite bright in the northern hemisphere doesn't necessarily mean it will be in the southern hemisphere, as uh, comets tend to be very uh, fickle things. Now, the image shown on this particular slide is taken um, from uh, the Spanish uh, Canary Islands and shows um, the, uh, the scale of it relative uh, to the background. And you'll, you'll notice in the uh, sort of left-hand uh, quadrant of uh, the screen, the uh, comet there stretching up uh, above the horizon. Uh, with its uh, iron tail and dust tail pointing uh, in the, the general direction away from the sun, certainly the iron tail is. Now before we uh, have our uh, August meeting, which uh, occurs in National Science Week, there'll be another committee meeting on the 22nd of July. Again, this one all will certainly be uh, via Zoom, so uh, nothing uh, face to face. And uh, any members of uh, MPAS uh, are certainly welcome to uh, listen in if they wish. And indeed, any committee meeting is open to financial members who wish to uh, come and observe uh, at any time as well. National Science Week um, this year begins on the 15th of August and goes until the 23rd of August. So it's always a slightly long, longer week than uh, seven days. And um, this year, uh, due to the uh, pandemic restrictions, almost certainly in Victoria, all events are going to be uh, online, uh, unless really, really lucky and uh, restricted numbers uh, are there. And um, uh, so uh, consequently, um, there'll be a lot of free activities online, free talks and uh, lectures to listen in and so forth and videos online. So well worth checking out at scienceweek.net.au. And on the subject uh, of astronomy, I've written four um, astronomy activity sheets. They're sort of a, aimed at the uh, lay public uh, and also um, senior primary school age and uh, maybe early uh, high school age uh, students on four particular uh, activities. So there are four sheets that you can download for free from the Science Week website, uh, website at the um, link that uh, is shown on uh, the screen. And those activities cover stars and planets, there's um, moon and sun, uh, satellites and uh, meteors, and also what to do when it's uh, completely clouded over. And uh, you'll notice I say when because uh, Science Week is always held in August and uh, it's usually about a 60% chance for us that uh, it's going to be totally clouded out or um, uh, under rain at the time. Now our next meeting is due on the 19th of August and uh, again almost certainly it's going to be an online pre-recorded event due to uh, the access restrictions at the Briars and indeed the scheduled speaker um, from the Bureau of Meteorology will uh, unfortunately need to be uh, postponed until probably next year I would say uh, depending on how quickly uh, things uh, go back to uh, relative degrees of normal, even if we can only have a, a dozen or two dozen people uh, in the auditorium. And at this stage, the uh, geological expedition down Point Leo on the 21st of November is still far enough away in the future that, uh, fingers crossed, uh, that will still be able to go ahead. Um, but uh, in the, uh, the current uh, climate without a vaccine, who knows uh, whether or not that will end up being uh, postponed uh, yet again. Okay, now with that, um, we'll go on to uh, tonight's talk, which is given by uh, Rosemary Marbling, who's uh, kindly uh, uh, offered us a, a video of the talk that was um, done in December last year at Monash University as our uh, plan B if she couldn't uh, make it. And indeed, uh, none of us could make it uh, this evening. Um, but uh, you'll get to see uh, the uh, the, the talk that was actually given and uh, and the question time as well and um, hopefully we'll be able to uh, meet uh, Rosemary again next year. She has actually spoken to the Society once before when we uh, gave the monthly meetings at the Peninsula School in Mount Eliza so it's been a little while since uh, she's uh, visited us um, but um, uh, you'll find uh, that she's very very knowledgeable and uh, you might also notice uh, where, where she is in the picture. Uh, uh, some people might uh, recognise that as being uh, Mentone Beach, so uh, not, uh, not too far up the peninsula from here. So with that, we'll uh, get into uh, the, uh, the main talk for the evening. But 
tonight's focus really is the, the Nobel Prize in Physics, or at least half of the Nobel Prize in Physics. Uh, and I don't know, I guess if you, you're here, you have taken some interest in, in this. Um, it's, an interest, uh, uh, it's an interesting citation we see here for contributions to our understanding of the evolution of the universe and Earth's place in the cosmos. Okay, so there's two things there, and we'll see the two things in a sec. But w as with all these prizes, there's always some political intrigue going on behind, behind it. And if you're interested in that, uh, you can ask me about it at the end. There's even some gender politics in there. Wow, so cool. Right, so, but I like, <laughs> so that was the main citation, but actually I like this quote from uh, the Nobel Prize website. Their discoveries have <coughs> forever changed our conception of the world, and that's what unites these two halves of the prizes. The first part of the prize went to James Peebles from Princeton for his work in physical cosmology. So cosmology, the, the universe at large, <coughs> and its evolution. And on the um, extremely opposite scale, length scale, the other half of the prize went to my colleagues Michelle Mayor and Didier Callot from Geneva for their discovery of an exoplanet orbiting a solar type star. Okay, they bothered to say orbiting a solar type star. I think I mistakenly wrote main sequence star in the abstract. I meant to change that <laughs> to be a bit clearer. Stars like our sun. Now, in fact, uh, one of Bernard and my uh, colleagues uh, discovered planets around a dead star three years earlier in 1992, Alex Volchan, and uh, he, that's part of the intrigue, the politics, why didn't, wasn't he on the list, and he hoped that he would be. But the thing is that uh, really this, this discovery made by Didier and Michelle is momentous because it tells us that the solar system is not the only planetary system like ours on, in which you can live, which can harbour life, uh, as we, uh, well, we didn't know if we were alone or not until 1995. So, so and, and in particular, the, the field has absolutely exploded and in, involves everybody, uh, all the fields of science, from geology to, to atmospheric science, mathematics, biology, and so on. It's really uh, changed the face of science, this discovery. So I want to give you a feel for this. So I'm going to give a little bit of an historical account to give you a feel for why it's so important. And, and also why it took till 1995 to, to make this, this discovery. So before 1995, for all we knew, we were alone. Well, of course, there are other planets in the solar system. We knew there was more than one planet, but certainly still today, we don't know of any other planets or any other place in the universe that harbors life. Um, people are certainly working hard on that. Uh, let me, yes, that's it. So there's the solar system, and so of course we, well, some, some of us still like to say we have nine planets. I'm still very fond of Pluto. It's very little though. Uh, but, but nonetheless, we didn't know whether that was all there, there was until 1995. And now, well, 1995, we knew just one other planet, and it's important to realise that it was, is a Jupiter-like planet. We'll come back to that, a big, a big planet. But now we know, thanks to the work, especially of the Geneva people, but of people all around the world, all around the world, uh, we know that at least 40% of stars, we, we're statisticians in the universe, well, we haven't studied all of them, but we've studied lots of nearby stars, and we can infer that most stars, or at least half of stars, uh, harbour planets. So this is, and, and you might say, well, yeah, well, of course. You know, it's like asking, well, do you, do you believe life exists elsewhere? Well, I don't know, but I just feel it just has to be true. Um, but actually, I'll tell you a little story about why, and Michelle Mayo reminded me of this, <coughs> people old enough 
even remember this, people in the field I mean. And that is the theory uh, of planet formation. How do planets form? Well, we didn't know. Uh, we've got a pretty good idea now, but as, as uh, recently as the 70s, well, actually the 80s, when I was doing my PhD, we still uh, took seriously what's called the capture hypothesis. And the idea was that two stars, well, a star, another star, came close enough to our sun for some material to be ripped off well, they probably ripped a bit of, uh, in the idea anyway, ripped a bit off from each other, here's my um, scrappy drawing. Uh, <coughs> materials ripped off the passing star and it continues on its way, but from the material that was ripped off, planets formed. Okay, so that's the capture hypothesis and it was certainly still taken seriously um, in the 80s when I was doing my PhD. Uh, this is, yes, I look here. The problem, well, the thing about the co a consequence of this formation uh, hypothesis is that planets would be very, very rare. That's because stars are very, very far apart in most places in the universe. For example, the average distance between stars in our neighbourhood is 20 million sun diameters. And so I had the, the um, potential high school students in mind, who aren't here, but I can say it to you anyway. I give the unit of distance uh, as in sun diameters, because, and this is how astrophysicists learn to think. This is how I was uh, teaching my honours student, Daniel, sitting up there, how to think. We think in relative terms. If I want to think about the likelihood of two stars passing close to each other, I, I want to think in terms of the size of those stars, not in terms of kilometres or metres. If I told you the uh, distance in metres, it would just be some great big number that's meaningless. Well, this is a great big number anyway, and it tells you that stars are super, super, super far apart. So, therefore, planets would be super, super, super rare if this is the way planets form. The other main hypothesis at the time was, uh, is called the planetesimal hypothesis. And uh, a Russian scientist called Safranov um, came up with this idea that, well, we, we, had, we know, well, we had a pretty good idea that stars form from interstellar clouds Gravity um, causes part of the cloud to collapse. And clouds themselves have some kind of spin, angular momentum we call it, and as the cloud shrinks under gravity, that cloud would spin up and a disk would form. So his idea was that from this disk swirling around the star that's attempting to form in the cloud, uh, material would accumulate into planets. And there's a, an artist's depiction of that process. So, but we still didn't know, well, which theory was, uh, was the good one. Until a few years later, in, 80, in the 80s, the first protoplanetary disk was observed. So this is a, a real picture of a dusty disk around the young star Beta Pictoris. And we're seeing it edge on. You know, you might see, and I'll show you a picture of another disk that we see almost face on. But this was the first protoplanetary disk, and this was confirmation of the idea that disks form around stars as they form, and the planetesimal hypothesis of Safranoff became the, para the paradigm, we call it, you know, the accepted theory of planet formation. Of course, there are lots of details to fill out, and people are working very hard to do that. But the general idea holds. Here's a picture, a recent picture of a real protoplanetary disk made by uh, the <coughs> using the telescope ALMA in Chile. And you see all the dishes there and it, we see very high resolution and we see gaps in and rings and so on and so we're, we're getting a better and better look at how planets form and we've even uh, starting to see 
uh, the uh, presence of planets in these disks. Okay, now another important part of the story of, of the Nobel Prize story and <coughs> the story generally is how uh, planets like Jupiter form. So remember the first planet to be discovered was a Jupiter-like planet. And the thing is that our theory, we still believe this, that um, planets like Jupiter need to form far away from their star. Now our Jupiter is 12 times as far away from the sun as the Earth. So we call this unit of distance an astronomical unit. So Jupiter is 12 astronomical units from the sun and, and maybe it's cold out there. It's really cold and ice, water in the form of ice, ha uh, well water happily exists in ice form out there. And these protoplanetary disks have a lot of water in them. And they also have a lot of dust, you know, the, the Earth is, is a rocky planet and basically it's just a whole lot of dust stuck together. But further, the further away from a star um, you are, the, the more uh, ice, like the planets uh, further out in the solar system tend to have a higher water ice content than uh, planets closer to the sun. So the idea is you've got all this water in, um, in this protoplanetary disk and you've got a lot of dust and you know what happens when you've got a dust storm and it's very cold in the atmosphere, the, the dust seeds hail. So you've got all this hail, this ice forming and sticking together and making a bigger and bigger planet core, we call it. And this happens, we believe, very quickly while lots, lots of gas is still around and this planet, this icy planet core accumulates or, or you know, creeps, we call it, a lot, uh, very quickly uh, gas <coughs> to become an, a, a gas giant like Jupiter. Jupiter is three times uh, the mass of Earth, three times as, 300 times as heavy and 10 times the size. So it's a whopper and that's important for our story too that it's very massive because as we'll see, we need lots of mass to do our detection, or for the, well, certainly Michelle and Didier did. So the message from this is planets like Jupiter need lots of ice to form. They cannot form close to their stars because it's way too hot. Ain't no ice right near the sun or any other star. So a few years after the discovery of, in fact, 12 years after the discovery of Beta Pic, a Jupiter is discovered orbiting the sun-like star 51 Pegasus. And there's Didier and Michelle from uh, back in those days and there's their, the observatory that they used to discover uh, this planet. So <clears throat> the crazy thing about it and the thing that really threw them and threw the astronomical community for a six was that this planet takes only 4.2 days to orbit the sun, the, its star. And so they're thinking, this can't be right, this can't be right. And you'll see how they did it in a, in a, in a sec. But <coughs> they thought, well, well, everyone told us that, that, that such a planet can only form far from its star where there's lots of ice. And these guys thought they were going to be in for the long haul, having to wait for 12 years or, you know, for a long time to see one, the effect of one orbit of, of a Jupiter-like planet. So they got lucky big, 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 big time to see this thing. But how the hell did it get there? Why, what was that ice, this, this uh, gas giant doing so close to its star? Now, here's a little piece, tiny piece of one of my favourite films about this story. And I don't know if we're going to be able to hear it because Steve, we're, we're a bit sort of unsure about our equipment here. Let's give it a try and if we can't hear Didier talking, then we'll move on. Let's give it a go. This is the dear little village where, where the um, observatory is. Each time they looked at the star, they plotted its speed on a graph. And each time they looked, the speed had changed. Every visit to the observatory gave them more data. 
and eventually a pattern emerged. When they looked at the graph as a whole, it showed a wobble. By March 1995, they were confident they knew what 51 peg was up to and believed they could predict its every move. Just as they were ready to test their prediction, they ran into a problem. And then as the sky is moving, you cannot observe uh, the same star during all the year. And uh, then the star uh, was not, we could not observe that stars after March. And we had to wait up to July. And then we had the curve, the wobble, we had a prediction, but we had to wait. And there they are waiting, that's right. There's a really nice BBC film made back then, back in the day. Okay, so why did it take so long to discover planets around other stars? So I'm going to tell you about the method they used to detect that planet and since then uh, hundreds of other planets. And then, uh, and I'll say briefly about another method <coughs> that's been very successful. Uh, why did it take so long? Okay, so the sun, first of all, you, you, you have to realise that we don't see these planets directly. There are a handful of planets that we can see directly, but the thing is, if you're trying to see a planet, say like Jupiter, it's like seeing a firefly in the halo of a lighthouse lamp. <laughs> the sun is a billion times as bright as Jupiter in our solar system. And the light that we see from Jupiter is, is mostly reflected light, unless you look in the infrared, that's another story. Okay, so we usually cannot see planets directly. So another thing to, to, to get a feel of is the relative, well really what, what is, well, what matters is the mass, the relative mass of the star and the planet you're trying to detect that is for this method that they, they, they used for this first discovery. Later on I'll talk about the size as well. But this, well we see that the sizes, uh, these, <coughs> the sizes of the planets here are to scale, their, their, their distances aren't to scale, so that gives us a feel. But the sun weighs a thousand times as much as Jupiter and that's really important for the story. So, the method used to, to detect the first extrasolar planet and hundreds after it is called the radial velocity method and this method uh, relies on it's an indirect method of detection so we're not seeing the planet directly but we're seeing the effect of the planet on the star and it's kind of like one of these hammer throw people you know when they spinning the thing around their head this heavy ball they they themselves kind of move in a circle they're actually moving around the center of mass of, of, the, uh, of the, the two objects. So for us it's a star and a planet. The planet is orbiting around the star and it makes the star wobble around the centre of mass. So <coughs> what astronomers do is they stare at a star hoping to discover a planet this way and they disperse the light. They, well for example if you shone white light through a prism you would see a little rainbow, right? They use some things called gratings, but nonetheless, it's the same kind of idea. And on, to on top of this rainbow, this um, spectrum, there are some dark lines, they're called absorption lines, and they're characteristic of the, of the gas, like a barcode. Uh, <coughs> a characteristic of the, of the atoms present in the gas. Mostly uh, planets and well, like Jupiter, and, and stars are mostly made of hydrogen and some helium, and there are other elements in there. But <laughs> So this forms a barcode, but the thing is, they, when the object is moving, or the star is moving, this barcode moves back and forward. It's like, it, well, it's called the Doppler effect. If a truck is moving uh, away from you, you hear it go, mm, and this is the, the sound wave stretching out as the, as the truck moves away. If it moves towards you, actually the sound waves compress and the, and the, the uh, frequency goes up. So the same thing happens with light. And so <coughs> if you've got a planet, well, if you've got a star wobbling due to an unseen planet, 
then sometimes the star is moving towards you and sometimes the star is moving away. And so this little barcode moves back and forward with a period equal to the orbital period of the planet. And this is how Michelle and Didier discovered this first planet. They were staring at lots of stars, hoping to see something, but like I said, they thought they'd have to, that little plot that we saw on the, on the movie, they thought they'd have to wait 12 years to get it to curve around, but they only had to wait, well, they had to wait f four days, but they wanted to look at it f over many, lots of four days, and, and check that it went up and down and up and down. And Diddy was talking about in there that, you know, stars, you can only observe stars when they're in the sky at night and, and you know, stars set like the sun sets and go be below the horizon and you can't observe them for some time. Some stars are in the sky the whole time but this one certainly wasn't. So they, <coughs> so they figured they, gee, this thing seems to be wobbling up and uh, wobbling back and forward every four days but, you know, is it really happening? We've got to come back after some months or however long it was and see if they, if they can predict where the next point on the curve would be. Okay, so in fact, uh, nearly a thousand of the 4,000 planets known so far have, have been detected this way, and this was the, the, well, this was the main way of detecting planets for quite some time. Uh, okay, well, there's a, a little animation of, of this Doppler effect. We see that the light goes uh, red and blue, sort of an exaggeration, and the stars certainly don't wobble that much unless another star is orbiting them. Then they wobble a lot. But this is just to, to give a, a feel for it. Oh, I've gone past. Where's that little thing? Yeah, okay. So you saw that the little dots on the, on the movie and what they were doing was plotting this. So there's a nice little formula for people who like looking at formulas, like me. Um, there's a, a if you can measure that little shift of the barcode back and forward, you could me measure the, sh the shift in the wavelength compared to what it would be if it wasn't moving. That's this well, uh, thing. Where's my arrow? My arrow. We can't see the arrow on that, Steve, doesn't matter. This delta lambda here, nice Greek symbols. I love Greek symbols, they make me feel good when I look at that. Delta lambda over lambda naught, the wavelength in the, the rest frame, the laboratory frame, happens to equal the speed of the thing you're, you're observing divided by the speed of light. It's very beautiful. So if you can measure this, you can work out that. And that's what this plot is, and that's what we saw on the little movie. And you can measure the, the period as well. Actually, this is a bit of a scrappy drawing. I mean, normally you'd have time, just time, normal time, in days on the x-axis, and, you'd, and, and the, the, the time between the minima, the dips, would give you the orbital period. And the radial velocity, in this case it's in kilometres a second, is on the y-axis. So you can measure how fast the star is wobbling. Now this, this example is an exaggerated ex example. That's what you'd see if you had a star like the sun and, uh, and a thing orbiting it that had a tenth of the mass. And if that was happening, at the distance that the Earth is from the Sun, it would be moving at 10,000 kilometres an hour, which is, uh, uh, well, it's a lot. I wish should have worked out what it is in seconds, in metres per second. The mass ratio of Jupiter to the Sun is a thousandth, like I said before, and if you put Jupiter at the position of the Earth, it would move at 100 kilometres. It, it, would, it wouldn't move at a... 100 kilometres, the star would move at 100 kilometres an hour in response. Now, 100 kilometres an hour is as fast as you probably drove coming on the freeway tonight. So that's not very fast as far as astronomical bodies go. And this is why 
uh, it was so hard to, to detect the first exoplanet because they're measuring tiny, tiny speeds. As for trying to detect an Earth planet uh, going around a star like the Sun, the Earth makes the star wobble and a measly nine centimetres a second. I can move my hand that far, just like that, poof. So, and we're trying, but not me, but the observers are trying to have built instruments to actually measure such measly speeds to try and detect planets like the Earth, orbiting stars like the Sun. And of course, if the, the closer the planet is to the star, the bigger the wobble. So it helps that if you have short periods, they make bigger wobbles. There's the, the uh, radial velocity curve of 51 peg. And actually, this curve was made by some competitors in America, and that's part of the intrigue and the whole story that I alluded to earlier. Uh, I should have put their little plot. Oh, I know I didn't. That's all right. OK, so radial velocity amplitudes, the size, the, 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 the size of the signal, as I said before, it depends on how close the planet is to the star, and it also depends on the mass of the planet. Right, so the guy with the hammer throw thing, if he just had a, a peanut on the end of his rope, well, he wouldn't move, like it'd just be pathetic. But the heavier the thing is, ugh, the bigger, the more he moves. And so there's the mass of the planet making the, the star wobble, and uh, how close it is to, determines uh, the size. Uh, well, the mass and the, the closeness or the distance of the, the planet determines how the wobble. So we see up the top, if we put Jupiter at, well, a twentieth of an AU, so that's like 51 peg, something like that, twentieth the dis our distance from the sun, much closer than Mercury. Mercury takes 88 days. See, you want relative numbers. Daniel knows that, don't you, Daniel, up there? Everything's relative. You've got to think in terms of relativities. So... Uh, if I, yes, put, the, put Jupiter close to the sun, I get the signal that the guys measured, something like 50 to 100 metres per second. If I put Jupiter further out, it goes down. I've got 28 metres per second there, and so on. The further away it is, the smaller the signal, the harder it gets to detect. OK, they're big guys like Jupiter. Jupiter's the monster in our, in our solar system, Neptune is, well, it's 17 times the mass of the Earth instead of 1,000, uh, instead of 300, rather. So it's much, it, uh, Neptunes are much harder to detect. And as for Earth's, well, it's down the bottom there, I said nine centimetres a second. There's these things called super-Earths in between. So Uranus is like Neptune, OK, so that's a, we call those ice giants. And uh, Jupiter and Saturn are called gas giants. But there's these things uh, people have, uh, the astronomers have discovered in the meantime called super-Earths, and they're like five to ten times the mass of, of the Earth, but they're, and they're rocky. See, Neptune and Uranus, well, they have big ice, rocky ice cores, uh, but they have a thick, dense atmosphere on top, so they're kind of in-betweenish kind of thing. So super-Earths are things that don't exist in the solar system, and we've discovered lots of those. Uh, okay, so why did it take till 1995 to do this? Well, I, I, I sort of mentioned before, it, it's, uh, you've got to be able to, to measure these tiny motions of stars. Astronomers have been able to measure, uh, use the radial velocity method to, to um, measure the motions of binary stars for 100 years. So if you've got two big things of similar mass moving around each other, they make a really big shift in that, in that uh, spectrum and it's very easy to measure. But these uh, planets uh, are a different question. Okay, all right. Well, <coughs> so the Geneva guys got to work making, well, they used a spectrograph that, that uh, so a spectrograph's the instrument they use to disperse the light to get the, the you know, the, the, the spectrum that, that we saw before. Uh, and they, then they, they made their own 
put it on their own telescope in, in Chile, and went on to search, search, do surveys, search, stare at stars, stare at stars, stare at stars, night after night, whenever these, the stars were up, and try and detect these wobbles. And uh, after 10 years, 10 years after the discovery of 51 PEG, so we're talking about mid-2000s now, about 200 exoplanets were known, but they were all Jupiters and Saturns because the spectrographs that, that, that they were using weren't, uh, well, didn't have the sensitivity, uh, high enough sensitivity to, to detect anything smaller or less massive. And uh, here's a, a, a bit of a daggy old plot from, from the day, but it, it tells us a lot actually. So this is uh, the a planet mass distribution. So remember, we didn't know anything about what was out there. Nothing. Like this is five minutes ago. If you're old enough, it really feels like yesterday. Um, <coughs> 1995, yes. Both my kids were already born. So there you go. It's pretty, it's yesterday. Here is a plot. Yes, yeah, so we've got the number of planets. So this is a, a distribution. This, on the x axis, we've got planet mass in Jupiters, in units of Jupiters. And what this tells us is there are many more, well, planets like Jupiter are much more common than more massive planets. So we go up to 24 Jupiter masses here, there's real whoppers, but still much, much less than a star. But this, this curve is quite smooth, really. It tells us that nature is making many more smaller planets than bigger planets. Okay, but they're still Jupiters, big monster planets. What about, these my arrows, what happens down here at lower masses? Does the distribution keep going up or does it go down? I mean, these were the questions people and still are the questions that we want to know the answers to. What's out there in the gloom? That's why I showed the picture at the beginning with the Earth sitting there in the black. I mean, we really were just there in the gloom all by ourselves. What's out there? And we know so much more now, and this is why the whole thing is worth a, a Nobel Prize. What's that telling me? Uh-huh. The beautiful harp spectrograph. So, again, the guys at Geneva, and in collaboration with, with people from other countries, but they they designed and built this instrument uh, in Geneva. It's called HARPS, High Accuracy Radial Velocity Planet Searcher. They dream up the acronym first and then try and fit some words to it. <laughs> yeah. And, and uh, <laughs> oh, no, because there's stories in that. Okay, now this, well, I've taken all the technical detail off this. I gave a, a talk about this at, in our department the other day. And so I had much more technical stuff there. Here's the cool, the amazing, amazing thing. They are wanting to, and they, they, this, this thing's been operational since I think 2003. They put their spectrograph inside a vacuum, in a vacuum tank. And the reason for that is, so one metre a second, okay, here's one metre with my hand. I mean, really you have to appreciate, we're try, they are trying to measure wobbles of stars that tiny. And in fact, I'll show you, is it, well, I think, I'll, I don't know if I've got the slide. They've now built a spectrograph to put on the, the VLT in Chile, the big telescope <coughs> in Chile that uh, can measure down to uh, nine centimetres a second. So they're really, really after the Earth's now in the habitable zone. But anyway, this thing, so yes, they put the, the spectrograph in, in a vacuum because any temperature and, and pressure variations will look like, will mimic a radial a, a velocity, will look like a velocity. And the, for, for, you know, I put that formula up before with the, the wavelength, the delta lambda on lambda, uh, we measure wavelengths in, in angstrom 10 to the minus 10 metres and, so, okay, 10 to the minus 10 metres. Okay, that, that's like, that's one angstrom. 
one metre a second produces a, a change in the wavelength of 10 to the minus 5 angstrom. 10 to the minus 15 metres. This is what they're trying to measure. Now, how the hell? I mean, come on, guys, that's just nuts. Well, it's certainly true that you cannot measure, you can't measure the shift of one of those lines that I showed you, the dark lines, by itself at that precision. But what they do is they, they look at the spectrum of the star and with thousands of lines and they compare that spectrum to another spectrum that's you know, a reference spectrum, they call it. Uh, that they, well, it's a long story, but they, they can detect, basically they're tracking the motion of all these lines and statistically, you can, you know, people who, who, who know about the central limit theorem, statistically, you, even though you can't measure one, you get the average shift and you can, and you can actually measure uh, shifts in wavelength uh, at, this, at this ridiculous level of uh, 10 to the minus 15 metres. Holy moly. Okay. So these high precision spectrographs allow us to detect planets like Neptune and Uranus. The super-Earths I mentioned before, so there's, you know, like in between Earths and, and Neptune, say five to ten Earth masses, rocky things, maybe people, are, things are living on these super-Earths, who knows. Uh, and so here's, a, here's an example. Um, here's a radial velocity signal. So we look at the, we've got days on the x-axis, how many days, 51. Now these are funny, these Julian days, so it's a funny, but <coughs> 1,005, so there's 500. So this is a long period planet that they're measuring, they're detecting here because they can see this sinusoidal thing. You see that it's not a perfect sinusoidal, it's got a bit, it's, it's got a, a bit of a wave on top of it that tells us that there's something even further out with an even longer period. <coughs> and we see the signal is of the order of uh, 50 amplitude, 50 metres a second, like 51 peg, but with a much longer period. But actually, so with the, the data we see here, there's blue dots and red dots with error bars on them, and there's some green ones too. So Coralie, it's a spectrograph that they built for on the, the Swiss telescope, and so that has a precision uh, of seven metres a second, still pretty good. But that HARP spectrograph, we can zoom in. Where am I? There. So it turns out that on top of that <coughs> superimposed on that big wobble is little wobble. We can see it here with the, the beautiful precision of the HARP spectrograph, these red points. So zooming in on the green, these should be green to match. These are the green points. Uh, there's actually a little wobble. And that says there's a short period planet in this system as well. <coughs> so there's 500 days or whatever it is on the big cycle. And then this thing, let's see, Oh, there it is. It says there, 9.45 days with a mass of 10 Earth masses. So tiny compared to Jupiter. So remember, Jupiter's 300 Earth masses. So they can detect that. And now, you, I haven't got slides up here, but one of the other things you may well ask, well, you know, it's all very well to be able to measure the stars moving like this, but the stars themselves have got all this bubbling... Um, atmosphere and magnetic fields mucking around with, with uh, the signal and they have to correct, to that, uh, correct for that as well and that's a whole other story. But they're getting better and better at it and really peering into these signals and, and seeing the presence of low mass planets. So, well, okay, that's a little slide just uh, indicating... Hmm the relative sizes of the planets, including these funny things <coughs> called super-Earths. Okay, by 2009, we knew that there were many, many 
more Neptunes and super Earths and Earths than there are Jupiters and Saturn. So I showed you that plot before with the curve going up, up, up towards lower mass planets, but still Jupiter kind of planets. And now, and this is actually an old plot as well, but we now know that the further down you go in mass, the more and more and more there are of these planets. They're harder and harder to detect, but they're there. So the universe, well, the near, nearby universe is chock-a-block with these super-Earths. Well, we're starting to detect Earths as well, uh, but Neptunes and super-Earths are super plentiful. And probably the little guys are even more plentiful. Uh, that we just have to have to wait and see with those. So this is, uh, yes, if we also know, and I, I made this statement right at the beginning of the talk, that at least 40% of nearby stars have planets. And actually they're just ones with their short period. So just like 51 peg only takes four days. The majority of planets that we know so far have orbits, orbital periods less than the orbit of Mercury, period of Mercury. I mean, there's, they, there's just zillions of these little things. Our solar system's quite special as far as we know. Well, they, we, I mean, really, we don't know because we still don't know how many stars have, have much longer period planets because we haven't been searching for long enough. I mean, if you want to see a whole orbital period of a thing that takes you know, 50 years to go around, you've got to wait for 50 years. And so, you know, it's early days for that. But we know there's lots of, lots and lots of, of these short period things. And I say to my students in my honours class, one of the reasons why the exoplanet field has exploded is because these, uh, the periods are so short, you, you, you can, in, in the time span of a PhD, you get lots and lots of orbits and so you can do lots and lots of work on it. If you had to wait for 12 years, well, you wouldn't have much of a PhD. Okay, so 2009 I mentioned, and this is the year that the, Hubble, that the uh, Kepler Space Telescope was launched. So I've been talking about the radial velocity method, this wobble method, and it allows us to actually estimate the mass of the planet. Um, <coughs> here's a different detection method. The other main, there are several others which I won't talk about, but this is the other main one. It's called the transit method of planet detection. And uh, well, we've seen, you might have even seen the actual thing, or at least uh, pictures of the transit of Venus, for example, across our own sun. So the idea behind the transit method is to, you stare at a star using uh, the method called photometry. Basically, you're just counting photons, ca collecting light in your light bucket, your CCD, like in your camera, and you're counting them, and you're staring at a star, and you see that the brightness is pretty constant, and you know, it doesn't change much. And what you're hoping to see is a dip as a planet crosses the face of the star and, and blocks out some of the light. So this is the transit. Of course, you have to have the, the, the planet, star planet system edge on. So you, most stars, you're not going to see this happen, even if they've got planets. But, you know, there's a, a, a decent chance of you seeing uh, a system edge on so that you, you can see this happening. So here is a, 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 an example of a, a transit light curve. And uh, we see this is just a piece of it. So we're seeing on the, on the uh, x-axis, if it's a bit hard to read, probably up there, it's a bit fuzzy. But it's just I've got time from centre of transit in days. Now, typically, a transit will take a few hours uh, for a planet to cross the face of its star. So, so most of the light curve is missing from this. It just goes for days, as in, depending on the orbital period. And then, <clears throat> so we've just cut out a piece here. So the bigger the planet, the bigger the dip in the light curve. So this is an example. This was the, actually the very first transiting planet discovered in 1999. This was its it light curve. Well, there's two, I don't know why it's, okay, they're given, given two epochs, two different transits. But you can see it's kind of noisy, but definitely a dip there. 
So when they discovered it, um, <coughs> they got very, very excited and got the Hubble Space Telescope onto the job and it is out in space, it doesn't have the atmosphere to muck up the signal and, <coughs> and here is its beautiful, beautiful light curve. And uh, there's some arrows there to indicate how big Jupiter would be if it had crossed that star. And so this planet, even though actually its mass is, is pretty similar to Jupiter's, it's, uh, it orbits the, the star in just uh, three, I think, days. And um, it's puffed up for reasons that, uh, well, partly because it's so, sitting so close to its star, but um, for other reasons too that I was involved in, in uh, part, of, part of that research. Okay, and if you try and detect a Neptune crossing the face of its star, you can see the green arrow there, you don't get nearly as much of a dip. And there's Earth, you probably can't even see it up the back, it's a tiny, and I can't point to it with this, but there's the Earth, tiny, tiny, tiny little thing. So the Kepler space, that's, so that's a Hubble, Hubble uh, pic a picture there, but the, the Kepler Space Telescope has has discovered thousands of planets this way and given us lots of amazing surprises that I haven't really got much time to, well I will mention my favourite surprise in a moment. But <coughs> here's the thing, the radial velocity method measures the, ma the planet mass because it's you know tugging at its, uh, with the gravitational pull and we use spectroscopy to do that as Michelle and Didier did. The transit method measures the planet's size because it just blocks out. It's just a simple ge geometrical thing, you know. You put a, uh, this uh, one sphere blocks out, you know, passes in front of another, it blocks out some of the light of the star. So you can measure the radius of the planet. And if you're lucky enough to, to observe a system, and we've, people have done this, we, I say we, well, apart, I have been observing and searching for planets in Chile, so I can say we with a little w. Um, it, if you can observe a system both transiting and with the radial velocity method, you can measure its mass. Well, actually with the radial velocity method, you don't know the orientation of the system. If, if the planet was orbiting the, the, the star face on, you wouldn't see any radial velocity effect <coughs> because there'd be no motion towards you, it'd all be just, you know, transverse. But you, you need it to be at least at some angle that's not face on uh, to, to measure the motion towards and away from you to get pick up that wobble. But if a planet transits, you know that it's actually edge on. So you know uh, the actual mass. If you don't know the inclination, there's, a, there's this uh, factor involving the inclination that's uh, <coughs> unknown. But so if you, you can measure the mass and the size, the radius, the diameter of the planet. And that, of course, once you know the mass and the, the size, you've got the mean density. And this tells us something about what the planet must be made of. At least, whether it's a gas giant like Jupiter, puffed up, or whether it's a rocky thing like the Earth or the super-Earths, or something in between like Neptune and Uranus. So the Earth has a density, a mean density of six grams per centimetre cubed. Sometimes people talking kilograms per metre cube, but that's like this great big, it's harder to, to visualise. In astronomy we use these, these little, these grams and centimetres. So six grams per centimetre cube, you can imagine picking up a rock, typical rock, centimetre cube, little block, six grams. Jupiter is one gram per centimetre cube on average, much denser towards the centre, much less dense on the outside. But these numbers tell us something about what the um, planets must be made of. I'm just about finished. One beautiful result from Kepler and from the radial velocity surveys is they are telling us the same thing about the distribution of masses and, and, and sizes. They are both telling us that the smaller the, uh, the planet, 
the more plentiful they are. So there's lots and lots and lots of us out there, Earth mass planets, they're the hardest to detect and uh, we're getting more and more of them. They got quite a few with the, with the, with the uh, Kepler Space Telescope. But really the holy grail is to detect an Earth around a sun-like star at one astronomical unit <laughs> and uh, in the habitable zone and we can, you know, speculate on... Well, actually, I should say that one, one of the offshoots of, of all this is to, to study the atmospheres of planets. So far, we, we can only do this with, with gas giants like Jupiter, but you can actually look at the chemical species in the atmosphere as the planet passes in front of the star. And in, in fact, when it goes behind the star and there's an absence of light, we can say something about that already. Um, and uh, just about finished, he said, okay, so my favourite discovery, but uh, um, it wasn't my discovery, of, of Kepler, was the multi-transiting system. So just, you know, the solar system is pretty flat. You know, the, the planets are all pretty much in the same plane, but there's little tilts between them of a few degrees. And if you could look at the solar system from far away, and you saw, well, let's say you saw Jupiter transit, you wouldn't see the other planets transit. So you wouldn't know they were there. Well, you, you might infer their presence from radial velocity, you could know they were there. Daniel uh, did his uh, honours project on um, um, partly to do with this. So he's heard it all. So these Kepler systems, it turns out, there are lots of systems, uh, planetary systems, with the, the, with the, where many planets in the one system transit. That means they're wafer, wafer thin. These planetary orbits are all on the, in the same plane and nature has, has arranged it this way and it tells us a lot about how planets form and this is um, uh, getting close to, to what I do my research on. But, but this was one of the most exciting discoveries, um, certainly for me and for, well, for all the, everybody in the field. So here is a cute little, um, oh yes, I have to use this. This is the Kepler orrery. So if you know what an orrery is, you know, in the old days, you'd have, people would make these little planetary systems and you'd, you'd wind the, the thing and the little planets would go around and the ones closest to, to the sun would go around fast and then the other ones would go around slowly. Little mechanical device. So my colleague Dan Fabriki uh, in Chicago, well he wasn't there then, but somewhere else, but anyway, he made this cute little... <laughs> so these are so, just some of the planetary systems, relative scale. See, some of them are slow, some of them are very fast. What's this? Very nice. So, did you know, I look at that and I see so much more than just things going round and round. These planets are interacting and they, they're like little fossil, fossil remnants of the planet formation process. And there's so much we can learn from studying these things. Okay, that's enough, Dan. And fine, almost finally, a second last slide. And how did these, that bloody planet get there? I said right at the beginning, well, how did it get there? You know, I gave you a lesson on planet formation and how these things form, they need lots of ice to form, and there's no way they can form near this star. And the answer is, and we had some understanding of it already, um, and, and Bernard mentioned my colleague, um, Doug Lynn in Santa Cruz, uh, certainly understood how this worked back then. So he was very excited when 51 Peg was, was discovered. And the, and the answer is, so you've got these planets forming in this disk of dusty gas. And you've got, they're getting bigger and bigger, more, more and more massive. And so they raise a tide, you know, they disturb the disk. And that disturbance 
acts back on the planet and pushes the planet in or out. So it's, it's a tide, it's like, you know, the, the moon raises tides on the earth and so on, it's a disturbance. And so we now understand that, that, uh, that this is the process that moves planets around. Now, solar system at Jupiter and Saturn are happily far out somewhere near where they formed. They've probably moved a little bit and we don't fully understand why they didn't move much and lots of these other planets moved hugely. And there are other ways, this is just one way to move a planet, there are other ways involving gravitational interactions that are uh, close to what I work on, but this is probably the main way. So yes, it's all okay, 51 peg is allowed to be there according to our theories. And uh, this is my last slide, the discovery of planets around other stars has forever changed our understanding of the universe. So it really, really, really did deserve this prize. Some physicists may feel that it wasn't, um, I don't know, intellectually as challenging as they would like to have a prize given to, but, but nonetheless it really has, uh, has revolutionised science. And so, cheers to Didier mm -hmm. and Michelle. Yeah. Thank you. So, if light travels at a constant speed, uh -huh. and so the further you look, the, early, the younger the universe is that you're actually observing. Right. And if I assume that the early universe has a lesser abundance and heavier elements, uh -huh. Is there a cutoff distance where beyond which there's no point in looking because chances of finding an Earth-like planet would be basically... Okay, that's a really, really, really good question. The, it, this, first of all, the simple answer is we can only see planets around very nearby stars. So we're not seeing anywhere back in the universe like it's just today, you know, okay. But if we were able to, to do that, this is a good question and certainly uh, people in our department think about uh, stars forming in the very early universe and how they could have done it without all the elements that are available to, to more recent stars. So yeah, this is a question. And, and actually a related question, in fact you don't have to look so far into the past to see ancient stars that were formed very early on. Globular clusters uh, contain very old stars and there have been a, 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 a continuing searches for planets in globular clusters. There's another thing about them though that the, the stars are very close together and they go around, you know, bumping into each other even sometimes and that may really wreck or, you know, upset the planet formation process. So that, but excellent question, yeah. Oh, yes. If we can see 40% of the stars which have a planet to earth, why can't we see the planets with them? Why can't we see the planets with the stars? Uh, uh, the question. This is a question. So, yeah, so, so I'm just... So the, the question is, if, if we can see 40%... Ask me the question again and I'll try. If we can see 40% of the stars... If we can see 40% of the stars... In the universe... Yeah, in the universe... With planets... With planets... Why can't we see the planets also? Visually. Oh. Well, why can't we see the actual planets? Yeah, why can't we? Yes, because there's so... It's like that picture I showed before with the big lighthouse. Did you write to me the other day? Is that you? Yeah. No. Oh, no, no, it was somebody yeah. else. Um, uh, okay, so the star is super, super, super bright, like that lighthouse I showed, right? And the planet has just got a little, it doesn't even shine all by itself. It's just got a bit of reflected light shining off from the star. And the planet's so tiny, it's just a little poof, like the little firefly. So it's just the star is just blasting it. You know, we can't see. But, but there are some planets, the baby planets, very young planets that are still a little bit bright, but as long as they're very far from the star, we can kind of see it. We can block out the lighthouse, the star, the bright star, and try and see little pinpricks of light far out. Yeah, excellent question.
Yeah. Uh, there was a program on TV a while back uh, with Brian Cox out in Australia, yep. up in the middle of Australia sort of thing, and they had a, a data package, there were other astronomers with him, had a data package of observations like you're talking about, which they released to the general public, as far as I could work out, and within the space of the program, yes. uh, they'd come back with, uh, you know, well, yeah, that uh, star you look at, it's got 12 planet front row rotating around it. I think it took them a couple of days. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But they must have some pretty sophisticated software out in the, for the general public to do that. Yeah, well, this is... Uh yeah, I don't know exactly what, they, but I remember I remember that because one of the discoveries was right up my alley and I got very excited about mm -hmm. it. But, you know, they, they have, um, uh, uh, what, what's, what do they call the, the science that, citizen science, citizen citizen science. science. Yeah, yes, yeah. that's right. And they, and for example, they uh, get uh, uh, people to look at pictures of galaxies and classify them. The human brain is, is still much better than a computer and we see patterns really well and I, I, I can't remember exactly what they, they were probably, they were looking at transit light curves I think. Yes. So, so, you know, like I, I showed you before a beautiful obvious example of a transit and, and, and exactly, yeah, so if you've got more than one planet going around what you're looking for mm. is, well if you just have one you see dip, dip periodically. But if there's more than one planet, mm -hmm. then there'll be another one with a different spacing. And sometimes they're even on top of each other. Not the planets aren't physically, but they're in front of each other. And, they, and so they were getting human eyes to stare at these light curves and try and see dips. Because, you know, the Kepler and other uh, transit surveys, they, they have an automated search algorithm that tries to look for these things, but they have to have little rules that may miss some. You know, they have to have a cut off. Okay, the dip has to be this much. But yeah, I mean, you know, the, the human brain is. One, one of the guys that came on, Brian Cox, said to me, Oh, you're an amateur, amateur astronomer. And he said, No, I'm a motor mechanic. Oh, yes. That, that was the guy. He, they, he discovered a system of. It was a chain resonance. Oh, <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, my favourite delicious thing that I'm working on. And so, so this is, and I, actually, I'll, I'll say, you know, I just said, oh, chain resonance, what the hell's that? Oh, it, these planetary systems are like little molecules, right? You've got a star, it's like the nucleus, and, and the planet's going around like electrons. Well, but the thing is that, that molecules, or let's just say an atom, right, a nucleus with, with electrons going around, they're in very definite uh, spacings, little orbital spacings and energies. It's, this is quantum mechanics. Now, gravity isn't supposed to be like that. I mean, whatever that means, isn't supposed to be, but it's not quantum-like. I mean, you know, it's a, but, but it turns out that it is kind of like that in a lot of cases. This is what I work on. My family just can't... Get, get any of my time because I'm <laughs> calculating, calculating. But it's, and, and gravitational chemistry is, is my <laughs> life's work. Thanks. I want to see an article. You NASA speak article up a little, Barry. Back that, so a few years ago. Yeah, you saw uh, an article a few years ago, yeah. 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 We offer 300 billion stars in our galaxy that could be as many as 3 billion planets like the Earth are in the Hapwell zones of stars like the Sun. Oh, yeah. yeah. The trouble is, the nearest one's so far away, forget about it. No, no, no. Oh, well, no, no, that's not necessarily true. So, so Barry said he, he, he saw an article that suggested there could be billions of planets, uh, Earth-like planets, in the, in the galaxy, in the Milky Way galaxy, uh, in the, ha the habitable zone of their stars. But he said, but the nearest one so far away, forget about it. Well, it almost certainly isn't. And, and, and actually, there, we already have some um, low-mass planets in their habitable zone. They tend to be around very low-mass stars because yeah. we, can, we can detect those more easily, well, in the short periods. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, so I'm saying, so there are lots of... The most common stars in the universe are much less massive. Well, let's say a tenth of... Uh, as massive as the sun, just like the planets, there are lots more little guys. It's like on the beach, there's lots more little rocks than big rocks, right? And, and, and so, uh, 
what was I? What was I saying uh, about? Oh yes, the little stars. That's right. So there's lots more of these things called M, M dwarfs, and and so the habitable and so they're, and they're much less luminous. They're much less hot, you know, relative where for at a certain distance. So the habitable zone is very close to the star. And so the st planets that are orbiting at those distances have short periods, and they're much, e and they, and and they they have a bigger effect on the planet, so they're easier to detect. So we've got those, but there will be zillions of us around there nearby, Barry, and 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 we just have to find them. They're just damn hard. I told you, nine centimeters a second. Come on, this is just crazy. Hi, Simon. Mm. So are those M top stars, are they easier to perhaps find the moon around? A juicy size moon? A juicy size mm. moon. Hmm. Well, are they easier to detect a moon? Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, I guess in, in the sense, okay, so these little these stars are, are smaller. In fact, they're about the size of Jupiter, these M dwarfs. Uh, and so if you had a normal sized moon like a normal, whatever that means, a, a moon like ours, yes, it would make a bigger dip, relative dip, as it transited than it would if it crossed a, a star like the sun. So, yeah. Hmm. Um, with the uh, new very large telescopes coming online in Chile and things like mm -hmm. that, is there an expectation over the next couple of years that we'll be able to know a lot more about exoplanets? Or is it more of a fact that the larger diameter of telescopes, it's sort of a diminishing returns, it's not going to give you that much more information? Or what's your thoughts on that? Okay, so, so the question was about um, the new large telescopes being built. Well, in particular, they have a lot more um, light gathering power. So, uh, and you can do, and, and the instruments they're building for them are high, higher and higher precision. A big problem with the big telescopes is that everybody wants to use them. And so, and one of the really important aspects of this uh, whole story, I'll ask you next so you can give your arm a rest, okay. Uh, a, a really important aspect is that these telescopes I was telling you about were dedicated, or some of them were dedicated to planet searching. And so they could use lots of time on them. And in particular, the Geneva team, because they built these instruments, they got what we call GTO, uh, guaranteed time observations. They got lots and lots of nights per year so they could look and look and look at the same stars and try and detect the presence of these things and also get, get figure out their orbital periods and so on. And so with these beautiful big telescopes, uh, you know, you're not going to get all that time. However, what they're going to use them for is with these other surveys that discover this or that planet, they, you know, every now and again we get a beautiful cherry. I mean, some amazing new system or very close or whatever. And we can use these big telescopes to stare at that particular thing we already discovered to try and study its atmosphere, for example, uh, and so on. So not so much time intensive, but beautiful instrument necessity to, to be able to to ask questions as long, you know, for example, are there, are there signs of life in the atmosphere of this planet, of this rocky planet? Uh, we look for oxygen. The Earth didn't have oxygen, much oxygen in the atmosphere originally, and life established itself somehow, and then uh, the, the atmosphere of the Earth uh, became very oxygenated, and this is... So that's an example of what we'll be able to use those amazing telescopes for. Mm. And, and I was going to ask you, yeah. Do exoplanets have moons? So, yeah. excellent question. Do exoplanets have moons? And this is the $64,000 if you're old enough question. That doesn't sound like much now, does it? Oh, well, what more than that? Um, okay, so we are still searching for moons. Tiny things, Simon asked up the back about moons. So what people try and see, a planet crosses the face of its star and we see the dip we saw before. And then we try and see if there's another little wiggly dip on top of the dip 
to, that, that shows a planet, I mean, a moon going past as well as the first. So it gets complicated because the moon's going around the planet and the planet's going around the star and you want to try and pick that up. So whoever gets that will be very, very happy, but we haven't yeah. done it yet. <laughs> Might be you. <laughs> Could be. Uh, the exoplanets they're finding, are they largely within the Milky Way or yes. beyond? No, that's a, a really good question. Yes, they're, they're uh, almost exclusively nearby in the backyard. Yeah. Uh, say within a hundred, well, you know, a few hundred li uh, light years. Hundred parsecs, but there are some much further away. So the Kepler uh, telescope, space telescope, stared at one patch of the sky. They picked a patch that wasn't too crowded, as we say, too many stars, but enough stars towards the centre of the galaxy. And so the inverse square law, most of the stars are very far away, so they are seeing some really far detecting planets around quite distant, uh, but still, you know, on this side of the galaxy, not all that far away. Mm -hmm. So as for other galaxies, you know, that's, oh, oh we dead. We forgot the time they detect anything like that. Yeah. Um, is there any chance that radio astronomy could be used um, to detect planets around radio stars with the development now of these large square kilometre arrays and huge radio telescopes? Okay, oh, all right, so Alex gets to have a, have, have a say. Uh, so the very first exoplanets <coughs> discovered in 1992 were discovered with the radio telescope looking at the pulsar and you, if you know about pulsars, these spinning, rapidly spinning dead stars, neutron stars, and they, so, they spin with such a precise period that anything that's mucking around with it, like a planet going around, mucks up the timing or changes the timing, and that's how they discovered the actual first exoplanet. And, and uh, so, but that's, so that's those, those. radio astronomy, um, well, Bernard, what, what can we say about radio astronomy and exoplanets? Do you know uh, uh, what people have got plans? I'm not an expert on that, but I think... You know, when people uh, write proposals... Places, that is everything, yeah. No. People write proposals <laughs> for all sorts of things in, in astronomy and in, like in all the sciences, and, they, and exoplanets are sexy kind of mm -hmm. thing, so they chuck that in somehow or other, and, and so <laughs> probably the square kilometre array's got it in there somewhere, but I, yes, I, I, I don't really know, actually. Huh? <laughs> okay, yeah? No, no, you're not allowed to say that in my class. No question no, is no, silly no. or <laughs> ignorant. I have that astronomy background, but I was fascinated to learn about how the stars rotate. I, I wasn't aware of that fact. So oh, yeah. every star in our universe rotates. So yes. the planets are rotating around an unstable star. Is that an unstable star? No. Well, they, they're happily. Well, it's like a you know an ice skater. You know, like so the the star formed from some cloud that was slowly just moving, you know, but as it shrunk, it's, it's spun up and up. And, um, and, and yes, and actually the sun would have been spinning very fast, or much faster anyway, than it is now. It spins every 20 something days. I never remember exactly what that was. 27, is it? Yes, 27 days. Uh, and so uh, everything moves in the, in the universe. You know, you look up in the sky and there's just some pinprints of of light around, they do look like they're just sitting there. But they're all moving with huge speeds. And the Earth moves around the sun at 30 kilometres a second. Did you feel it? Oh, you know, we can't feel that. Right, the sun, the Earth spins once every 24 hours. Holy moly, when you think about it, that's pretty, that's a lot of spin. <laughs> and, and the moon's orbiting there, and everybody's, the sun is flying around the galaxy at 200 kilometres a second. And we're going around the sun as it goes. Everyone's going for a ride. And all these stars are going around the Milky Way on the big race course. Yes, 
Well, no, no. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. The Earth, yeah, yeah. The Earth's going around the sun, and the sun's going around like that. Yes, and the moon's going around the Earth. Everybody's going around everybody. Yeah. The Milky Way is moving through the universe, through the. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, light's not really like sound waves, so whether it's coming towards you or away from you, it arrives at the speed of light. That's right. So why do you get a Doppler effect? So, well, so it's about the, the energy. <laughs> He's asking me why does the Doppler effect work with light waves? Given well, the, the waves shouldn't bunch up because it's, a, it's going away or coming towards you. It's still arriving. Well, it affects the, the frequency, but why? not the speed. Well... Uh, well, it's to, Bernard can answer the question better, but yes. it's about the energy of the... Mm -hmm. Well, it's actually a tough one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank God. That's, that's a, a really a tough one. And, uh, uh, well, the, the point is, I mean, Rosemary, is true, the, the, the frequencies change, and that does mean that you see the, the crests of the waves actually bunching up. But mm. this uh, speed of the crest of the waves, that is not really the velocity at which the, the photons, the particles of light, travel. Um, there's, there's a difference in physics between this velocity of the wave crests, which is an apparent velocity, right? So if you mm. if you but it's like a cork a cork on a on a exactly exactly that analogy. Yeah, but right? they, so they, they they're not waves, they're not relativistic though. I mean. Yeah. Light is. I mean, light shouldn't bunch up, should it? I mean, you're, you're, you're comparing them to physical things, which uh, which are different. They they they're different. You know. Like like if two cars travel together at certain speed, they're additive or subtractive or whatever. But light's not. No, no. Well, um, yes. Yeah, so I mean, it, 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 it's go on. <laughs> Yeah, it, I think it's absolutely true. But, uh, the, I think the key difference is to recognise that the, the, the speed of the particles, that re it's really different from the speeds of the electromagnetic wave crests, electric field and magnetic field going up and down, uh, very much like this example of water waves that Rosemary was referring to. Um, the, the, it's, what you see is the pattern, the spacing of the of the wave crest, and that changes when the uh, when the source of the electromagnetic radiation moves. And it's it's not because the, the speeds of the waves move. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I think just a lay person's understanding of this. Mm -hmm. um, if light's composed of not just one frequency, it's composed of just a, a vast spectrum of of sine waves or whatever. So the the relative shifting of those sine waves may change. The actual speed of them won't, so it may appear as though there's a bunch of going on. No, but even if you had just one, uh, you know, one frequency, this would happen. I mean, the mm. frequency would change, but if you just had, if your source of light mm -hmm. was one frequency, uh, and you'd see, well, if it's just sitting there, you'd measure <coughs> certain distance between the wave crests, and if the source moves, it kind of bunches the wave crests up, but the speed is still the same. But it's still it's the same thing would happen with just one yeah. frequency. Mm -hmm. But yeah, good, good possibility. I need mm -hmm. to, can I, before, uh, I, I'm going to take your question, but I want to know if Joseph is here. Is Joseph? <laughs> my man, you were sitting under my nose. I'll meet you afterwards. Yeah, okay, <laughs> sorry, yeah. Uh, just the uh, gravity uh, can be light, uh, and do you have to take that into account in <coughs> your observations? Uh, well, it's just too small. To no, no. However, general relativity, which is beh behind that, it does have to be taken into account in our calculations. People, people need to go. Yes, but uh, so, so not the bending of light but certainly relativistic effects do need to be taken into account. Look, thanks for coming, everybody. I really appreciate you coming out here to, to Monash.
Hi, Mark Stevens here with Sky for the Month for July 2020. Hope everyone's enjoying lockdown and hope you find this informative. As for the highlights for July and August in 2020, there are several uh, rather interesting uh, aspects. Uh, the first one was earlier this month on the 4th, Earth was at Apelion. Uh, essentially meaning it was as far from the sun as it uh, ever gets. The uh, probably explains some of the cold weather we've had. Several planets, Jupiter, Pluto and Saturn, are all in opposition this month, which means they're technically as close as they get to Earth on this, uh, this orbit. So Jupiter on the 14th, Pluto on the 16th and Saturn on the 21st. Comet 2P Enki is about 0.3 degrees north of Alpha uh, Sextans, which is just above Leo on the 18th of the 7th. I believe these are in the evening twilight, so they may not be all that visible. 88P Hale is 1.3 degrees northeast of Spiker, which is uh, the brightest star in Virgo. And Mercury is at greatest elongation west which means it's as far from the sun, or apparently as far from the sun as we see it, uh, and it is a morning object. The, the moon is at perigee. Now, that basically means the moon approaches uh, the Earth on the 25th of the 7th uh, at its closest point. Uh, on the 2nd of the 8th, Comet 2P Enki is in Corvus, uh, the crow, uh, and will be at about 8th magnitude. And Jupiter and Saturn have close encounters with the moon uh, on the second as well. The full moon occurs on the 4th of the 8th, and the moon will be at apogee or furthest from the Earth on the 9th of the 8th. Venus uh, will be at maximum elongation west, once again indicating it's a morning object on the 13th of the 8th. And on the 18th of the 8th, Mercury will be in superior conjunction, which means it will be on the other side of the sun to us. As for the night sky looking south, there are several items of uh, interest. Before I go any further, please note this is a chart from last year, and although the stars and constellations are in the same spot, Jupiter and Saturn aren't where they're indicated on uh, on this particular uh, chart. However, both Jupiter and Saturn are quite easy to pick up, given the relative brightness of both uh, planets in the sky. Items of interest uh, on this chart, though, uh, there are several globular clusters. Uh, up uh, top left of the chart, you'll see M15, which is a globular cluster in Pegasus. You also have in the tail of Scorpio, or near the, sorry, near Antares, M4, which is a globular cluster in Scorpio. You also have 47 Tacane down in the Tacana and Amiga Centauri. Uh, so for those that are interested, uh, a bit of a globular cluster hunt uh, could be the go for, the, uh, for this month. In addition to that, we have an open cluster in M7 near the tail of Scorpio. And the Southern Pleiades and Eta Carina down in the uh, in the Carina there. You also uh, have the Tarantula Nebula right down the bottom there in the Large Magellanic Cloud. The July sky looking north also contains a couple of globular clusters. Uh, they should probably be uh, fairly close to the horizon, but may be visible if you have a good northern horizon. You've got uh, M3 there in uh, Coma Benicis, and to the right of that, just above the uh, north mark there, is M13 in Hercules, which is also a globular cluster. Additional to that, you have M22, which is an elliptical globular cluster uh, up in Sagittarius there. Uh, once again, ignore the positions of Jupiter and Saturn. In addition to that, uh, towards the north, you also have uh, both the Ring Nebula uh, above Vega and the Dumbbell Nebula uh, as well. Could be a couple of uh, good objects to, to have a crack at.
As for the planets this month, Mercury begins the month in inferior conjunction, basically meaning it's between us and the Sun, although we won't get a transit because for that to happen, we need it to be uh, on exactly the same plane as Earth. And unfortunately, at the moment, it's not. From there, we'll move into uh, the morning sky, reaching its maximum elongation on the 23rd, which I know uh, seems a little quick, but you need to remember Mercury uh, scoots around the sun fairly quickly. It only takes 22 days to travel through a quarter of its orbit. It uh, reaches the superior conjunction on the 18th of next month. Venus, uh, currently a morning object, having moved through its inferior conjunction, i.e. between us and the Sun, uh, last month, it essentially spends most of the month moving towards its maximum elongation, which occurs in August. Uh, the Earth, as I said, was uh, at Apelion on the 4th of this month. Uh, also still has that nasty bug and uh, last month's optimism apparently was a little bit uh, optimistic. As for the outer planets, uh, Mars is rising around about 11 p.m. now uh, as it moves towards perigee or closest approach to the sun. Unfortunately, that causes uh, was expected to cause dust storms, which may make uh, viewing any detail a little bit difficult. It doesn't reach opposition until October, so there's a lot of hope that these dust storms uh, will be a little less than uh, they were the last time we went past it. Uh, Jupiter, it moved through opposition on the 14th. Uh, it is in a, a very good place for observing at the moment, particularly its bands, red spot and the various moon configurations. Saturn, uh, it reaches opposition on the 21st of this month. Uh, if you look in the sky at the moment, Saturn and Jupiter are very close together. And uh, as for Jupiter, Saturn is in a very good viewing position. Uh, its rings uh, are worth checking out to possibly uh, even see Cassini's division. Uranus is still in Aries, which uh, I think I've said in the last couple of months that will be there until 2024. Uh, and so it's currently a morning object rising around 1.30 uh, a.m. Uh, in the middle of the month. And Neptune is in Aquarius, rising in the eastern, eastern evening sky. Appearance of the planets uh, this month uh, obviously depended upon their, their relative positions. Obviously, Jupiter and Saturn uh, being in or having per just passed through opposition are both quite uh, good viewing objects, able to see the full planets. Venus, of course, has gone through inferior conjunction, and so the crescent will start to appear on the other side and uh, get larger as the planet moves uh, further away. Mercury, uh, if you could see it in conjunction with the Sun, would be a uh, little black dot because we're looking at the back of it or the unlit side. As it moves towards its greater elongation on the 23rd, uh, you will start to see an increasing amount of crescent. Mars, uh, we're slowly catching Mars in terms of our uh, orbital position. And you can also probably see uh, Mars, of note there, is it also should appear in uh, gibbous form. Uranus, Neptune and Pluto, depending upon the size of your telescope, not much more than little greeny blue, blue and little white dot. Other items of interest this month uh, generally consist of a significant number of comets. Uh, seem to be finding new ones all the time. Uh, not all of them were listed in my reference material. However, three that uh, have been around and are certainly viewable at the moment is 88P Howe, high in the evening sky in the constellation of Virgo, setting around midnight. Uh, it's expected to brighten from 10th to 9th magnitude and from the 21st to the 25th of this month, it should be within two degrees of Spica, which is the brightest star in Virgo. 
Comet 2P Inky uh, is in the evening sky, but it's uh, fairly close to twilight. Uh, it does get higher as it moves away from the sun and uh, moves through several constellations starting in Cancer and ending the month near Corvus, which is the crow. Four stars in a parallelogram type shape, fairly easy to, uh, to find. And Comet Panstars is low in the northern evening sky, so it relies on a good uh, northern horizon and it's about seventh magnitude. Uh, Mid-month it moves into Coma Benicis, climbs higher as it moves to the south, uh, although it is likely to dim to 8th magnitude. Minor planets this month that are in opposition uh, include the five that are listed there and the dates that they're in opposition. Three of them are in Sagittarius, uh, one in Serpents and one in uh, Vulpa Killer. They're fairly low magnitude, so you'll need a, a reasonably good telescope to be able to find them and probably best uh, to try and locate them using astrophotography over a couple of nights. Interesting little project for someone. And in conclusion tonight, we uh, carry on with Steve O's Solar System Tour. Uh, this is part three. And as a quick look at the solar system's hottest planet, Venus. Uh, Venus is named for the Roman god of uh, love and uh, very similar in size to uh, the Earth. Initially considered Earth's twin, but uh, closer scrutiny of it has realised it's, it's really an evil twin uh, due to its uh, greenhouse effect gone crazy. Has a diameter of 12,100 kilometres, no moons, and it is 0.67 astronomical units, or uh, just under seven tenths the distance from the sun that Earth is. It has an orbital period of 225 days, so a bit faster than uh, the Earth, and it's best viewed before sunrise or after sunset when it's at its maximum elongation. Uh, I've written there can, it does appear as crescents like the moon. And an interesting uh, facet of Venus is it rotates retrograde. It essentially means the sun rises in the west and sets in the east. The uh, atmosphere on Venus made up largely of carbon dioxide and droplets of sulfuric acid. I don't believe too many of the probes that have been landed on Venus lasted very long. I think 45 seconds was the, uh, was the record by a Russian probe. Getting a bit closer to Venus, so you can see it is, uh, or what you're looking at is a considerable amount of uh, cloud cover. It uh, explains its, its brightness in the sky because this cloud cover is extremely reflective. However, although it might look very pretty there, not a place you'd want to live. In comparison, the uh, other four uh, inner rocky planets, you can see it is very close in size to, to the Earth, the Earth just being slightly bigger, definitely bigger than both Mars and Mercury. And that picture probably does it more justice. And that concludes tonight's uh, Sky for the Month for July 2020. Thank you for listening. Uh, I hope you have found it informative. I hope you're all staying safe and uh, isolated. And the information brought to you tonight was contained in Astronomy 2020 by Wallace Dawes and Northfield. Thank you. Hello everyone, from the program, the main talk would have been on exoplanets. I hope you did keep your eyes agog and your ears a flapping. Lots of exciting science there. So my one will be light on science, the little bit of science will be the signs of light.
first up, most of my life, I did not know this. I did not know that the colors of peacock feathers are mostly from diffracted light. They are not color pigments. The minute structures of the feathers are diffraction gratings. And look at the phosphorescent colors, such as stirred up by dolphins. This one is on recent news from California. But I will share with you that while sailing in our bay of Port Phillip, I witnessed this shocking apparition of three large torpedoes alongside our racing yacht. They were dolphins lit up, swimming with us. Some time later from another cruising boat, I stayed up in the middle of the night, not only to watch the brilliant million stars in the dark, dark sky of the Whitsundays, but to repeatedly throw the end of a piece of rope into the water, to splash up this phosphorescence, and to see loads of lit up little fish fly up. We hear a lot more about refraction and reflection including what goes on inside our telescopes and cameras. Here's a double rainbow, someone looking downwards from a South Bank skyscraper. At that time, I saw a huge semicircle double rainbow from my home too. Now it's trendy with COVID-19 to show the inside of our homes to the world. So here's my inner sanctum. This rainbow, in quotes, is from a diffraction grating square, five by five centimeter, placed on a windowsill. I see colors, gorgeous colors, every day, everywhere in nature. Rainbows just sparkle, sparkle from dewdrops on blades of grass. And see how fascinating it is that out of such grotty, messy brown soil, or among lifeless rocks and sand, magically emerge these flowers and fruits with such brilliant colors and awesome, intricate designs. Some of these colors switch back and forth or roll like waves. Just so amazing, beyond words. What cause all these colors? All the answers are at your fingertips. You can get them faster than I can say boo. Answers are everywhere. I've said before that questions are more important than answers. As you view the next few slides and things around you in daily life, what do you think cause or dynamically change the colors? Pigment, diffraction, 
Refraction, reflection, electrical charges, magnetic fields, biological processes, or a figment of imagination. I do have a favor to ask, please. I need help to find uncopyrighted music to color my talks. Some lively clips as an intro. Please help. Please send them in. To convince you how much I need help, I shall close recklessly. With giving you an unwanted gift, recorded on the day the Melbourne Exodus started, heading for the Mornington Peninsula. Rocking, rolling, riding out along the bay. All bound for morning town, many miles away. Somewhere there is sunshine, bam bam. Somewhere there is rain. Somewhere there is morning town, many miles away. Too. Yeah. All right. So we're gonna go until we find the first, uh, first good spot. spot for camping. Anybody need to stop again? Just say it. Yeah. The following tips will improve your ability to navigate in the dark. Whether you plan to go on a night hike with a family or infiltrate a secret location with other ninjas, you will be able to look at a bright light or the full moon and immediately afterwards see what's happening in the dark shadows on the ground. Before explaining the tips, I will describe the basic biology of how human vision works. Light enters your eyes through the cornea. The lens then focuses it on the retina, a light-sensitive layer of tissue at the back of the inner eyeball. The retina acts like the film in a camera, with the optic nerve sending the information to the brain. Cones provide color vision and require brighter light to function than rods, which provide black and white vision under dim light. Rods can be stimulated by as little as one photon of light. Rods and cones are distributed differently across the retina, with cones concentrated in the center of the visual field and rods in the peripheral areas. The human retina contains about 120 million rods and 6 million cones. The number and ratio of rods to cones varies among species, with night active animals having mostly rods. Rods contain the protein rhodopsin, which enables night vision. When exposed to bright light, rhodopsin immediately bleaches and night vision disappears. After bleaching, it takes approximately 20 to 30 minutes to regenerate rhodopsin. Okay, now on for the tips. That eye is now adapting to the dark and it takes about 20 minutes or more for this bright light on my face to uh, 
so that we can see what that after that bright light's turned off. But with this patch, you can see immediately. Right. So we're walking around under a full moon and we can see okay under the full moon, but if we really want to see under the bright, uh, into the shadows, mm -hmm. we just lift the patch right up and you can immediately see in the dark. Oh, okay, cool. Embrace the way of the ninja. Stay low and view silhouettes. At night, we mostly see with rod cells, which are particularly sensitive to shapes, outlines, contours, and movement. Ninjas take advantage of this fact and get lower than the objects they are trying to see. This works because shapes and objects are backlit by light sources such as the moon and stars. Use your peripheral vision. Do not look directly at what you want to see, but rather look off-center. Uh, your peripheral vision is mostly composed of rods and they are sensitive to low levels of light. Your central vision is mostly composed of cones so if you really want to see something clearly in the dark, look in the peripheral areas around what you actually want to see. Keep your eyes moving. Do not stare at one object. Staring will cause your eyes to adapt to whatever light sources there are in the visual field. Blink frequently. This will keep your rod cells from desensitizing. If you don't want to lose your night vision, use dim red or green light. Red has been the traditional choice since before World War II when it was discovered that soldiers could see pretty well with dim red light. However, recently there's been a switch where green is, is very often preferred. Uh, the choice is not clear cut. It depends on the situation and, and the individual. Recognize that dim red or green light may not be enough in, in order for you to see the level of detail that you need to see. So in some situations, you may want to use white light. And if you choose to do that, again, what I like to do is cover one eye so that I have preserved dim light vision in one eye. Sustained bright sunlight can impair night vision for up to two days. Wear sunglasses whenever you are outdoors to avoid this cause of poor night vision. Neutral gray glasses like these with a UV resistant coating are often recommended. Some people wear red tinted glasses during the day for an hour or so before they go into dark areas. Every person and every situation is different so talk with your eye doctor for specific recommendations. Have you noticed that deer become frozen stiff when your car's headlights blast them at night? This is because they're temporarily blinded and can't see you. You probably had the same experience happen to you when you're hiking with a buddy at night and he suddenly turns and all of a sudden you get blasted. The best thing to do is to turn your gaze to the side so that you can avoid a direct light or a, a close one eye quickly. Now, if you happen to have an eye patch on, then you automatically have one eye that is not night blind and you can continue to see easily in, in the dark. A quick and easy way to improve your night vision is to clean your glasses. This is something I forget to do all too often. Any dirt or streaks will cause reflections that make it difficult to see. And it also works on your car windshield. Use all of your senses to see. Walk slowly with a walking stick and your arms outstretched. Listen for sounds that may indicate obstacles and feel the surroundings with your entire body, your feet and your hands. Move your hands so you don't run into things like, like tree branches. All of this will create a visual field, a crude visual field, so you'll know where you are. You may want to, to look at some of the references down below on how blind people walk with walking sticks. And some people are able to use echolocation the way bats do to find their way around. All of this takes practice 
and it's, it's worth exploring if you want to do night hiking with minimal light. Okay, fallen logs. Don't want to trip over that. Eat a balanced diet with plenty of veggies. Make sure that you get enough vitamin A and zinc. If you have diabetes, try to get it under control. People with diabetes are at a high risk for night vision problems. Over the years, high blood sugar is toxic to blood vessels and nerves in the eye, and this results in poor night vision. If you are a smoker, try to stop smoking. Uh, smokers are more likely to get uh, cataracts, optic nerve damage, uh, and macular degeneration. Some studies have shown that smokers are two times more prone to night accidents than non-smokers. The black of night gives most people fright, but me, I feel free in the black of night. In the black of night, most people lose their sight because they cannot see without their precious light in the black of night. Most people think the black of night is not right, but not me. The black of night is one of the most grandest sights. Every day I wait and wait, waiting to see that beautiful sight. Every day I wait and wait for the black of night. <laughs>